Good morning, and uh, I want to thank Tigran and, and uh, his colleagues for the splendid invitation uh, to, co to come here uh, this morning. Uh, and um, my plan uh, is to take us from Stockholm to Las Vegas via Detroit. And uh, Detroit might seem to be an odd kind of uh, stopover spot, though of course any of you who have traveled by airline know that uh, you get scheduled on some, on some, weird, on some weird places. Uh, but Detroit would seem to be uh, the exact opposite of the kind of city and place where we'll be discussing for the most part today. It is the ultimate uh, American industrial city, the ultimate gritty city, the ultimate material uh, city, and even by the standards of Las Vegas binge gamblers, it's had its ups and downs. It started you know, right, right in the center of the country, uh, a, a, a quiet uh, lake, lake port that in the early 20th century suddenly uh, exploded as uh, the motor city, the city that uh, put the world on wheels, that basically invented the mass production and assembly line process. Here you see one day's production of Henry Ford's uh, uh, Model T uh, in around, around 1910. And by the middle of the 20th century, basically represented uh, the industrial city and seemingly uh, poised for uh, decades, if not centuries, of dominance. Uh, only, o only by, say, 1980, certainly by 1990, uh, Detroit's fortunes turn, as I say, quicker than a, a Las Vegas gambler. It becomes uh, the showplace, you might say, for deindustrialization, for, uh, uh, for uh, Rust Belt uh, abandonment. Uh, the the old Central Railroad Station, it becomes the, you might say, the, the capital of industrial ruins in the United States. Uh, uh, going from a peak of almost two million people of the central city to what is now less than 600,000. So uh, crowded neighborhoods like this have turned into this uh, with the massive uh, abandonment that goes with it. Uh, different, <laughs> you might say, from, uh, from Las Vegas. So what is, what is the connection? What, what is the connection? Uh, my argument is simply this, that uh, Las Vegas, especially the Strip, represents uh, the contemporary embodiment of an urban design paradigm that has been haunting uh, urban design for at least 100 years, and that is the linear city. Yeah, f as I say, for, for most of the 20th century, there has been this dream of somehow freeing uh, modern design and development from the congestion and irrationality of the old dense cities and giving them the speed of, say, uh, a single track railroad or a great highway. As Le Corbusier once observed, the city that achieves speed achieves success. And the idea of the linear city was to uh, marry the uh, power of urbanism to uh, the speed of a speeding locomotive or, or automobile. And uh, it's my further argument that this uh, linear city, uh, though it's usually presented in architectural terms uh, as a kind of utopian paradigm, in fact was realized in Detroit and realized as a way of managing this, uh, what was then advanced form of industrialization. So I'm pointing to a rather different uh, uh, genealogy of the Strip. Uh, 
as I say, through this uh, industrial, essentially industrial paradigm of the linear city as it develops both theoretically and also uh, theoretically uh, from figures like Le Corbusier, but also uh, pragmatically in the very real city of Detroit. Uh, and these are, as we'll see, the, t the linear cities of industrialization that uh, are coming out of the central city of Detroit that basically, as I say, are to me the predecessors of the Las Vegas Strip. So, and here it is, here it is on, on the ground. Uh, as it looks as it looks today, in spite of the uh, all the uh, stories of of Detroit deindustrialization, it is the city and region are still massive industrial powerhouses. So, uh, as I say, what you know, what is this uh, this genealogy of the strip that I uh, that I am uh, proposing? As I say, the, uh, all, the linear city is essentially about getting away from this, getting away from uh, the, you know, the early 20th century experience of density, not in the Jane Jacobs sense, but density as congestion, pollution, irrationality, uh, uh, the, you know, the, 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 re the realities of, uh, of the dense city. And uh, the idea of somehow escaping the city by, in effect, unspooling it, uh, running it out as a, as a line, uh, goes back to the late 19th century to Surya Imada's Suida Lineal, proposed and slightly built for Madrid. But it was really in the 1920s and the 1930s among uh, a group of Soviet architects and planners called disurbanists, uh, where the theory, at least, of the linear city emerged. This is the, uh, you know, the, uh, the black and white part is the, the classic diagram from uh, uh, Milyutin from 1930, showing how he wanted to see the, uh, the, the industrialization of the Soviet five-year plan to proceed. And uh, <laughs> uh, the, you know, the basic linearity comes from the rail line running between two large cities. That supports uh, a production zone of large factories, uh, which is separated from the residential zone by this uh, green zone, uh, so that the, the factory workers you know, enjoy proximity uh, to their work as well as proximity to nature. Uh, the factories are supplied and connected by this high-speed rail line. You have a kind of marriage of town and country uh, that uh, Milutin and the others believed would fulfill uh, the, uh, the aims of Soviet industrialization. Le Corbusier, who was actually active in the Soviet Union in the late 1920s, uh, takes up this idea in the 1930s and 1940s. This is his, ver this is his version with uh, the different uh, rail and, and auto lines, uh, automobile roads connected to the factory with uh, the living quarters uh, based, on, you know, based on the high-rise unités, uh, again, in close proximity to nature. And Le Corbusier, uh, uh, in his uh, Trois Etablissements Men, uh, basically establishes this larger theory of uh, the linear city uh, as a kind of synthesis of the, the old-fashioned, what he calls radiocentric cities, dense cities. Uh, there's the city, there's the, the green countryside, and running between them is this linear city, which is the, as I say, the synthesis of the urban and the, and the rural. Uh, connected not only to the central cities, but as you can see from this map, forming a kind of uh, <clears throat> network of communication and production that would unite countries and even whole continents. <laughs> 
So that was the vision, and it's usually treated as a uh, utopian kind of a utopian kind of exercise, except as I would argue, as I'll argue this morning, uh, it was actually realized in the city of Detroit, uh, where you know this is this as you'll see this is our linear city with, uh, you know, based on the Midwestern mile grid, uh, run, you know, with the, um, the uh, rail line on one side, the uh, highway on the other, massive industrial plants in between, and workers' housing on both sides. And here, you know, here you see the, the two principal linear cities, uh, one running along what's called Mound Road, north-south, the other uh, running along another highway and rail line called Gross, uh, Grossbeck Highway. Uh, this is the linear city in reality. And as I, as I will argue, a kind, a kind of predecessor to the strip in Detroit. Now, where does this come from? Essentially, uh, Detroit, which is right here in the middle of mid in the middle of the Midwest, uh, Detroit uh, comes out of the Motor City comes out of this uh, most advanced industrial you know this region which was the most advanced industrially and this industrially in the whole world, essentially from about 1860 to to 1960. Formed really on one side are the uh, <coughs> the iron ore of the Mesabi Range that you see in dark red. On the other, the tremendous coal deposits of the American Appalachians. Together, they make steel, and steel made the Middle West uh, the most productive industrial area in the world. Now, Detroit was, as I say, a relatively minor player in this. Uh, uh, until the coming of the automobile industry in the early 20th century. Here is Detroit uh, in the late 19th century uh, with its industries clustered as was convention conventional close uh, to the Detroit River that connect, uh, connects to the Great Lakes. Uh, as I say, a, a, a comfortable but not a revolutionary place. I mean, I, I think ironically, the Detroit's great success on the world scale comes out of this, which is uh, the Michigan timber industry. Uh, Michigan had the, one of the greatest forests in the whole world, the, Mich uh, the Michigan White Pine Forest. It was cut down in about 20 years, between 1880 and 1900. Uh, which is what you see here. I've always hoped that this is a opposed picture, because somehow the idea of these two horses pulling that load, <laughs> I, I can't believe it would actually happen. Regardless, a lot of people got very rich out of this destruction of the forest. Most of them lived in the city of Detroit, and they understood that the forests were not going to last forever. They were the ones who were cutting them down. So they needed a new thing. And it was 1900, and it was clear the new thing was the automobile. So the money from the timber industry, in kind of venture capital fashion, went into uh, financing automobile plants in the city of Detroit, like, what, like the one that you see here. And I think it was only in Detroit that this man, Henry Ford, uh, could go bankrupt three, three times in five years and still find finance for what would become the Ford Motor Company. Uh, Ford was the, uh, you know, the genius of the first phase of Detroit's uh, industrialization. This is, this, believe it or not, is the uh, machine that changed the world, the Model T, the first automobile that was uh, broadly affordable uh, to uh, the middle class and, even, and even, even the working class. And that, as I say, put the world on wheels. <laughs> 
Uh, <laughs> I couldn't resist adding this. There, there are in fact a, a fair number of these automobile, these Model Ts still still around in Detroit. Uh, I don't. I didn't actually drive it. You know, it it, dry, it it runs very differently from a modern car. But for what it's worth, uh, you know, I believe I'm a kind of hands-on historian, and. So back to, back to the back to the mo back to the Model T. Uh, you know, Ford's genius was not so much in the car, which was really not a particularly uh, advanced one technologically, even in 1908, but in the production process. Uh, he was absolutely you know he he realized he had to revolutionize the way automobiles and advanced technology was produced to make it affordable. And so he turned what had been a craft-based uh, uh, operation into the uh, mass production assembly line uh, world that we know today. This is the, the place, the, uh, uh, the headquarters, the, the main factory, where, where basically it all took place. And the you know the the production of the automobile was was done on this assembly line fashion, as you can as you can see here, uh, revolutionizing the way in which uh, uh, all our technology is produced, and uh, this this revolution in production then I think raised a, uh, a kind of similar question. Uh, Ford had completely changed the way in which the automobile was produced, uh, what we call scaling up, scaling up production on a, uh, on a, on a uh, uh, unheard of scale. Uh, but how can you scale up the city? That is, how can you make the city work for this vast new scale of production? That was, you know, that was the issue. And in a sense, Ford, you know, Ford sort of came up with the answer to some degree that his factory was, uh, you know, right, it was at the you know, seemingly uh, you know, the, most of the factories were down by the Detroit River. His was right at the top of the map, uh, seemingly in the middle of nowhere. Why? Because that was where two important rail lines uh, converged. The belt line that surrounded the city that handled the, the freight traffic from all the different lines coming into Detroit and the main line going out of the city. So it gave him uh, unparalleled connections to uh, the rest of the city and the rest of the country. And the, uh, the factory, you know, other factories tended, to, you know, started spontaneously to follow that logic, to leave the crowded old factory districts and instead to distribute themselves along uh, the, these uh, rail lines with which Detroit was well, well provided. You can see, you know, from, from this map showing essentially the main production headquarters, uh, you know, the, the coming of this, in effect, linear city based on, uh, based on the rail lines. Uh, Ford himself, or the Ford Motor Company, kind of opted out of this revolutionary role. Uh, Ford instead uh, put all, uh, started one huge factory uh, called River Rouge just outside the city of Detroit uh, that produced some wonderful pictures, such as this, this photograph by Charles Shaler. Uh, but was in fact, I think, a, a massive step backwards because it was an attempt to produce the whole automobile within a single factory, to make your own steel, to make your own glass, to make your own paint, and so on. Uh, a crazy idea when you're in the middle of the greatest industrial region in the world. Uh, but that was Henry Ford. <laughs> I mean, he was a, an evil megalomaniac, uh, among other things. So, uh, 
I think the, if there was a real uh, mind behind this Detroit linear city, it was the architect Albert Kahn, who did work for Ford, in spite of the fact that Ford was, you know, Kahn was Jewish and Ford was the most notorious anti-Semite of his time. Uh, but Kahn also worked uh, for the other automobile companies and production companies like General Motors and Chrysler, and it was for them that he really uh, 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 produced, uh, he understood, I think, before anyone else, this logic of the linear city and how it could be made to, to work. And so uh, he worked very extensively on all of these, on almost all of these major factories coming out of the old industrial belt. Uh, this, this most important one I call the Mound Road Linear City because it, it runs along a, a, a road named, named Mound and uh, it includes many of Kahn's most important uh, industrial structures. Uh, here you see it in, in somewhat greater detail, as I say, running pa the, the big factories run uh, between the rail line and the, <coughs> uh, and the road uh, and connect to each other. They connect to the rest of Detroit and they connect to the rest of the Middle West. Kahn was always, in planning his factories, he was always very mindful of especially uh, the rail connection, bringing the rail lines right into the factory itself. So, in effect, he had, you know, he was dealing simultaneously with three scales of uh, linearity. There was the scale of the Middle West, as I say, the great industrial region of the world, uh, Pittsburgh for steel, uh, <coughs> Akron for tires, Toledo for glass, and so on, uh, that connect through the railroads directly to Detroit. Then there's the city of Detroit, and you know, with its own dense network of, uh, of factories and suppliers, and finally the individual factory itself, like this is one of uh, Khan's wonderful uh, uh, daylight factories, as, as they were called. As you can see here, uh, the rail line runs right into the factory itself. So you have, you know, in this one facility, uh, materials from around the Middle West, uh, <coughs> finished goods from the city of Detroit, and finally, uh, the last scale of linearity, the assembly line itself that produces, that produces the cars. This is the, you know, this is the, the way, you know, the, it was this form, this putting together these different aspects that made uh, Detroit the overwhelming industrial power of the mid 20th century. And this is uh, perhaps Kahn's most famous uh, uh, daylight uh, factory, the uh, Dodge truck assembly plant, which was on Mount, on Mount Road, directly on Mound Road and the start of a whole series of these factories. Uh, this aspect of Detroit uh, came into greatest prominence during the Second World War when uh, <coughs> the whole Mound Road complex became a kind of uh, arsenal or factory for, uh, for the war effort. Here you can see the, uh, this is uh, again some of the production, the truck production. You can just see at the edge of that, that's Khan's original building, now part of a much larger complex for war production. Uh, the, <coughs> the, you know, the factory is literally rising in the fields uh, for massive uh, war production. Khan at work. This is perhaps his masterpiece along the Mound Road Industrial uh, Linear City, the Detroit Tank Arsenal or Factory. Uh, which became a kind of uh, uh, mass production facility for tanks, as you can see here. Just one figure that gives you a sense of the, uh, the power of this, of this uh, linear city. 
1941, as it happens, as all of you know, Hitler uh, terrorized Europe and virtually conquered the Soviet Union behind a strike force, a terrifying strike force of 5,000, 5,000 tanks. This single tank factory produced during the Second World War 26,000 tanks. So you can see this was a, you know, this was production on a world-changing scale. And after the Second World War, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the power of this productivity uh, for, for a brief time actually uh, benefited the workers who were, you know, who were employed there. Uh, the, they had strong unions who were able to ensure that uh, a, an appropriate share of the productivity and increased productivity would go directly to the workers. At the same time, there was a uh, massive uh, program for the production of these suburban houses uh, that uh, revolutionized uh, uh, not just the construction of small single-family houses, but uh, revolutionized their financing as well, making them affordable for the Detroit auto workers. So uh, just to give you some sense of what this means, for Le Corbusier, uh, this is Le Corbusier's version of the linear city. Uh, you know, with, as I say, the, uh, uh, the rail and, and electric lines, the big factories, uh, a, a limited access highway, and then on the other side, these uh, unites for the workers in this beautiful uh, 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 landscaped setting. And here is uh, you know, an aerial view of, the, of an actual, the actual linear city in Detroit along Mound Road. Uh, here is the rail line, uh, one, of, one of the massive factories that, that, uh, <coughs> that Kahn designed, Mound Road itself, and not the unités of Le Corbusier, but the thousands of small uh, uh, workers, uh, single-family houses for the workers in those factories. That was, you know, in a sense, the, to me, the meaning of the, the linear city as it developed in, in the United States. So one, one last uh, uh, co comment or, ser or series of comments in terms of what happened to the seemingly invincible uh, uh, form of industrial production. Well, as Le Corbusier realized, the, the logic of the linear city uh, was to join uh, you know, whole countries, whole regions, whole countries, whole continents in this continuous uh, line of productive activity. And this initially, at least, worked against Detroit. As, uh, you know, as I mentioned, the whole power of the Detroit linear city came from its positioning within the most advanced industrial region in the world, the Middle West. But you know, during the 1940s and 50s and 60s, uh, through complacency and incompetence, uh, the leading American industries like, uh, like steel and glass and so on all uh, lost their supremacy to either Europe or Japan. Japan, uh, here, you, here you see uh, the, t you know, the, the center of Toyota production. Uh, Japan uh, was able to create its own kind of version of the linear city that really did span continents and oceans uh, to, you know, to take materials that were uh, you know, that were produced in, in Japan to ship them not only across the Pacific, but across the, the continent of the United States uh, to provide this, 
uh, you know, this, this level of linearity to the Toyota plant in Kentucky where the automobiles were produced. And the, you know, one thing about you know, most advanced production, not only in automobiles, but in most industries, there are really two components. One is the, uh, the, the advanced engineering, the kind of high skills, uh, high skilled workers and engineers who are necessary to produce the really difficult parts of an automobile. And then there are, you know, there's the more routine kind of assembly work. So in this version of the linear city, the advance work was done in Japan and the, uh, you know, the, the less difficult assembly work was done in Kentucky. As you can see, this, this, the Toyota plant is in the middle of nowhere because it doesn't really need any support from a city. Uh, you know, it just needs relatively cheap workers from the rural areas ara uh, around it. And this uh, combination was, you know, was a deadly one, uh, or almost deadly one, for the city of Detroit and its form of production, leading to this massive uh, abandonment. But Detroit has found a kind of response and you know, a sort of flexibility. I mean, one thing that I certainly learned from Stefan's book on the Strip was how flexible the strip was in responding to different conditions and ideals. And Detroit, too, learned, you know, learned to change. They basically formed an alliance with Mexico. And this area down here, uh, just, just to the northwest of Mexico City, where they could produce the relatively low-tech uh, parts that were needed for the automobile leaving the, you know, the high-tech part of production and design in Detroit. So they form a kind of counter-linear city uh, that, that connects now uh, Mexico to Detroit. And on this basis, the Detroit automobile industry uh, has, you know, has revived. So the uh, Kahn's uh, truck assembly plant uh, is still making trucks. It's, you know, the Kahn design is buried somewhere in this, va in this vast complex, uh, but they're still making trucks. Uh, the big, uh, one big difference, I think it will be illustrated by these next two slides. Here is the production line for, you know, for the truck engines from, ni from 1940. Uh, here is the production line for, for the trucks today. I think you can see the difference. Uh, uh, exactly how the, the linear city will work. Will, you know, will production, in effect, come back to Detroit with robotics and uh, 3D printing so that we don't need Mexico anymore? Uh, you know, there are many different possibilities. But uh, I, you know, I, I submit, as I say, in its, in its flexibility, in its basic logic, uh, there is more in common with, uh, d between Detroit and Las Vegas than one might imagine. So, thank you.